Hello and welcome everybody to today's webinar, how to win the battle between production planning and scheduling. My name is Martin Karlovic and I'm the host for this webinar today. I'm CEO and one of the owners of Netronic Software and at Netronic I'm responsible for strategy innovation, go to market and I am responsible for everything we do related to uh, Microsoft Dynamics 365 Business Center and the vision. Um, for obvious webinar related reasons, you're on mute uh, over the course of this webinar. So if you have a question, then please uh, use the go to webinar chat pane to uh, answer that question. And um, I will either answer right away, or if I'm doing a demo, I, I might not see that you asked the question and then I will uh, answer it at the end of the demo, respectively at the end of the webinar. Um, Although you're on mute here, um, I'm more than happy to communicate with you guys. So th don't take this as a sign that I don't want to communicate, but um, just take this as something that comes with the technology and the nature of webinars. So if you have any question um, or if you have an idea on how we or our products or I can do better, then please send me an email. You see my email address there or connect on LinkedIn and message me there. And just by the way, I'm hosting a actually quite popular podcast called the Business Central Manufacturing Show. And as this is a webinar that is related to Business Central and Manufacturing, I assume that you are interested in Business Central and Manufacturing. And most of the time, people that are interested in a topic also have something to say about that topic. So... If you would like to become a guest to my podcast, then also send me a message on LinkedIn or send me an email and uh, I will get you up for one of the next episodes. And with this, let's uh, jump into the uh, topic of today's webinar, which is not an introductory level webinar, um, which is also not a webinar where I show you the product from A to Z, but it's a, it's a webinar where I would like to discuss also concepts and thoughts and approaches and also maybe best practices with you. And then in the end, like try to turn my thoughts and my ideas around planning and scheduling, turn them into a demo. So the demo part um, will be at the end of this webinar. So if you came here and expected a 60 minute demo of whatever a visual production schedule, a visual advanced production scheduler. I have to disappoint you, but we are running almost daily introductory webinars um, on the uh, on our three extensions. So then if you need an introduction to our products, then also again, send me an email and we set up a demo for you or uh, join us for one of these introductory webinars. So this webinar today will be a lot about con concepts and thinking about business central and manufacturing and business central and production planning and scheduling. And as the title suggests, um, I personally think, um, and I'm, I'm, I'm not, on, I'm convinced that there is a gap between planning and scheduling, and sometimes even planning and scheduling battle each other. So. Um, and you might rightfully say, okay, this title is a little bit provocative. So why the heck is there a battle? I mean, let's say a battle between production planning and scheduling, because like if we look a, a little bit naively and a little bit roughly at the products, planning and scheduling, they are not that different from each other. And they are like semantically e e comparable. I would, wouldn't say that they are identical. And the thing that the words planning and scheduling are so comparable, sometimes in my point of view, starts to create a confusion because then people don't differentiate them. And then if they don't differentiate, then you get into a situation where you actually want to schedule, but plan or where you plan and want to schedule and then things fall apart and then actually planning and scheduling start to battle with each other. So although there are distinct um, differences between planning and scheduling, of course, both of them have one very important aspect in common. And this also makes it sometimes hard to, to differentiate them. So both planning and scheduling aim at balancing demand and supply, right? So so both planning and scheduling are words 
are, are verbs that that target at creating an equilibrium, right? The equilibrium between demand and supply. When it comes to planning, it is the 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 uh, it's the balance between demand of items, supply of items to get this right. So if you have, you have demand uh, for items coming from production orders or coming from sales orders, um, and if you have a supply from the item, something that you assemble or something that you that you purchase, something that you get from your subcontractor, something that you build, then then planning tries to kind of always have enough supply to meet the demand. With scheduling, it is also balancing demand and supply, but it is more the demand for your capacities uh, and the supply of your internal capacity. So this is what scheduling um, is is like meant for, whereas planning is more on the on the item demand and supply side of things. So so this already this this descriptions about what which kind of balances planning and scheduling want to achieve. This already indicates that there are some. And I would not even call it subtle, but there are some really substantial differences between planning and scheduling. And let's let's try to look at them. So, if you really think at uh, about planning and what planning does, and also if you read literature, what the purpose of planning is, the purpose of planning is to define what to make and also roughly when to make it. This is what you do when you plan. You define. I need to whatever i need this amount of that item in that week or i need these items with this amounts in that month so this is planning and then the purpose of scheduling in contrast to it is it's the definition of the exact when to make it not roughly when to make it but exactly when to make that particular item and also by whom or on which machine to make it so in essence the output of planning the definition what to make and roughly when to make it is the input for scheduling so scheduling takes the data that is created by planning the definition of what to make and when to make and then uses this data as their ingredients to define when to make it and by whom to make it and in which sequence to make it. So this is scheduling the other roughly and what is planning. And so planning most of the time when I see it also with our customers works in bucket of time. So in months or weeks. We want to do these items with these quantities in that month. We want to do that items with these quantities in that whatever quarter or in this week. And typically, planning is it's simplified. It's based on the assumption of infinite capacity, right? When we do planning, when we define what to make and roughly when to make it, we actually don't fully care if we have whatever. 2000 hours available that week and how, how much uh, hours this the, these productions will consume but we, we we just look from the demand side of things okay what kind of supply do we need to generate to fulfill these demands and so planning is overall a bit rough cut, right it, it it works in buckets of time infinite capacity and it's it's quite rough whereas scheduling it works with concrete timings I will make production order one, two, three, four next week, Monday, starting at 8.15 or starting at 8.15 and 27 seconds. So this is, it works with concrete timings and it must take into account concrete constraints, right? It must take into account information, for example, if a machine is down or not. It must take into account the finite capacity, it must take into account how much the machine can handle that day, that week, that hour, whatever. And it, as it takes the output data of planning, it translates them, it makes the rough cut plan actionable. So scheduling is about making the plan actionable. And, and we all know um, the phrase that, uh, that uh, a goal without a plan is a wish, um, but I would also say it, it, a plan 
without a schedule is unrealistic. So, so the schedule makes your plan actionable. It makes it realistic. It makes it attainable. And so what the schedule does is the production order in the machine sequence. It defines, I want to put this production order here. I want to put it there. I want to do this, where, that, that day, that hour, that minute. This is what scheduling does. And now, as we define this, we can actually look at these differentiators between planning and scheduling one after one and try to figure out what this means in, in terms of how to make these things really work hand in hand and not against each other um, so that you can really set it up and define it in a way that planning is the one task, scheduling is the other task, planning delivers an output, what and when to make, and scheduling takes this as an input for scheduling and then breaks it down into something actionable. And, and the first thing is, we have to agree, we really have to agree that planning and scheduling follow different purposes. And if we agree on this, then here is my first recipe that I want to give you today, uh, that, that if you feel that there is a battle between planning and scheduling, then apply this recipe, then accept that planning and scheduling are different. And as these are different tasks, do not use the same tool for both, right? Although planning and scheduling sound similar, it's really different. Different purposes, different tasks with different desired outcomes. So don't make take the same tool for it. And as they are different, and, and you could say, okay, but I have a planning and scheduling software. Yes, this one size fits it all approach. That sounds really promising, but in it in your case, most of the time, the result is either pain or lack and a lack of efficiency. And I have these these pictures here, right? These are drills. This this is a drill, and this is a drill. And what you do with the drill is drilling, and what you do with this drill is drilling, right? This is rough cut drilling. And this is very granular, very to the point, very to the target, very, very, very small holes, right? And you could take this drill for that task. Well, this will be painful. Or you could use this drill to get the same hole done that, that, that this guy does with this drill. Well, this will work. Both will work. But here... Using this drill for this task is painful. Using this drill for this task is just inefficient. You're using the wrong tool for the, for the wrong task, although the task seems to be the same. And it's the same with planning and scheduling. If you use planning software for scheduling, it will be really, really painful. And if you use scheduling software, for planning, it will be inefficient. And so make sure that, that, that you and your colleagues, your customers, accept that planning and scheduling is different, it, different purposes, and they require different tools. So I really, really recommend that you look at this as not one thing, but two different types of tasks, and you need a tool for the one, and you need a tool for the other to avoid pain and to avoid lack of efficiency. So. Now that we talked about the purpose, let's also talk about the next differentiator. And this is that planning works in buckets of time, like the month and week, whereas scheduling works with concrete timings. And, and again, um, this, this sounds subtle, but this is very huge. And I have an example here. And I bet that if you are a manufacturer or if you're a partner work with a manufacturer, you have seen these kind of examples more than once, most likely every day, I would say. And so let's look again, what, what, what's the difference between the buckets of time that we use for planning and the concrete timings that we aim for with scheduling? So the planner on Monday morning, he might face a situation and say, oh, I checked the demand and the supply for this week. And hey, actually, we need to create 100 units of item A, 50 units of item B, 75 units of item C, and 60 units of item D. 
So there are four items with different units that need to be made. And you said, okay, let's create the production orders for that. So the planner checks demand and supply, recognizes that there is a missing supply, and he creates the supply by creating production orders, right? And he creates those production orders for that week, right? He, he doesn't say, I need item A on that day. He just said, I need it this, this week, 100 of A. 50 of B, 75 of C, and 60 of D. And then he creates the production orders, and the production orders are the input data for the scheduling. So the scheduler, the person who does the scheduling, and it can be the same person than the planner, but the guy who is doing scheduling takes this input data and says, oh, here are four new production orders that I have to schedule. And then he looks at them and says, oh, gosh, this item D actually requires my machine number two. And I know that machine number two will be down for maintenance today and tomorrow. And I know that, that creating 60 units of item D is, is quite a bit of work. So I make sure I get it done this week. So I schedule this on my machine two from Wednesday to Friday. So machine two bid down for maintenance today and tomorrow and rest of the week busy with item D. Luckily, item A and item B require machine one. So he says, okay, then let's do item B first for whatever reason and uh, does it today and tomorrow and then item A on Wednesday and Thursday. So there is a bit of time still left on item uh, on machine one for Friday um, with item C. It doesn't matter if you produce it on A, a machine one or B or two. So it, the, the planner schedules it on machine one for Friday. And then he knows, okay, with this demand and with knowing that the one machine is down for two days, well, the capacity is well used for this week. And he had made an actionable plan. He said, okay, on Wednesday, we will start with item D on machine two. And today we do item B, we run until tomorrow, and then on Wednesday, we switch to item A, and on Friday, we switch to item C, machine one. And then the next day, the planner comes again and says, hey, let's compare demand and supply for this week. And he's like, whoa, you see, there was 100 units of item A that were needed for this week. For some reason, it's now 120. So maybe the customer increased the order or we have a second order. Actually, the planner doesn't care if this is a second order or if this is an, an, an increase in the existing order. He just sees there is no demand for 120 instead of 100 units. And he also sees, oh, there's a new demand, 40 units of item E. So he de most likely deletes the old production order for item A and creates a new one with the demand of 120. And he creates a new production order for item E. This is what the planner does. And then the scheduler, who has the actionable schedule that is actually in the process of being executed, comes and says, OK, woo, holy moly, where's the production order for item A that I had scheduled on machine one for Wednesday and Thursday? And now it's Tuesday for tomorrow. He had a, a schedule for tomorrow, and the production order is gone. And then he sees, oh, there's a new one for that item of a larger quantity. And then he knows, okay, I need to run that machine uh, one for item A from Wednesday to Friday. So, boom, machine is busy, right? Originally, I had planned to produce item C on the machine one on Friday. This is no longer possible because now the machine is busy with B and A, right? And he sees, oh, there is another demand for item E, although the plan was already, the schedule was full for the week. So, in the end, he might decide to, to, uh, to plan for an extra shift on Saturday morning to get the item C on machine one and item E on machine two done. This is, and here you sense a bit of the battle. Like the planner just bumps the demand into buckets of time and, and this creates confusion with what the planner is doing. And, and, and we need, don't need to talk about what happens on Wednesday. I think you, you get... Um, you got the point, right? This is most likely what the planner, how the planner reacts. He's, you know, he's stressed. He he feels pressure, right? He he has to make this fist and slam on the desk because, like this this planning guy, killed his schedule, right? 
It removed the production that was scheduled for tomorrow, made the quantity bigger, added another one, not taking care of capacity, just filling this bucket of time with demand. And and this happens. I see this happening with customers that I work with. I know that partners see this happening with customers that they work with. And I heard customers saying this, that this is really, this is creating tension. And it's creating tension because there is this one function planning that schedules demand in buckets of time. And there's this other function scheduling, which really makes it precise and actionable. And so the recipe number two, the advice number two, that it is if, if you agree that bucket of times and concrete timings are different, then do not mix them, right? This is a bucket. And this is a concrete sequence of things. And now imagine in this bucket, you would build a concrete sequence. And then next day, whatever, your spouse, your son, your daughter comes and just shuffles the box, sequence is gone. Or, or, or puts three new uh, bricks in there, shuffles the box, sequence is done. So have something where you build your sequence to keep it stable. And then have your buckets where you just drop the demand. So. If you build a concrete sequence within a time frame that falls under the bucket of time planning approach, this is really the fast track to frustration, right? Just imagine you, you sort the things in this box, in this bucket, and drop another brick in, shuffle it, boom, frustration. So the recommendation is really to define a time frame for which you want to and for which you have to be concrete. Say. Okay, I have this time frame, and for this time frame, my schedule needs to be precise. I have to be very concrete. And then it's fine also to apply planning, and it's fine also to apply an approach where you use bucket of time planning, but do it after that period or, or minimize the overlaps, but have a dedicated period of time where you, where you afford to be concrete. And then after that, just put the demand there and see roughly if it works or not. But really differentiate timings, time frames where you want to and have to be concrete and where you are okay with things being a little bit rougher and a little bit less concrete. And that's fine. But, but separate these time horizons, right? Let's come to the next differentiation between planning and scheduling. And the planning is based on the assumption of infinite capacity, right? We just dump another production order here. We increase the demand for that production order. We add another item. So happens day by day by day. The scheduler, the poor guy, as we saw in the, in the, in the very primitive example, has to take into account concrete constraints such as finite capacity, right? And now the question is, what does it mean to take into account concrete constraints and i tried to find an example that that resonates with me where where i did some well some planning slash scheduling exercises where over time there are more and more constraints and the more constraints i got with starting with a really rough approach created frustration and this process is preparing for a travel and preparing for a travel or planning or scheduling a travel by car with manual tools. Like, like I'm 51 years old. When I was traveling by car in the past, when I was younger, this was my tool to plan. It was manual travel planning and manual travel scheduling. I had a map. I looked at the route in the map, and then I looked at the map when I drove or when I did a break and then continued the ride, right? That was really manual travel scheduling right now, right? And today we have tools to automate this because we have to take a lot or we learned that taking constraints into account when executing something that was planned manually is quite tough. So let, let's give you an example. So you can use, you can use a printed map easily 
to say, hey, I am in Munich. I want to drive to Hamburg because I heard there is these great directions, EMEA event later this year. You can easily do this, right? And you could easily also, with, with a tool like this, say, well, you know, I want to take the shortest route, kilometer-wise, right? I want to save whatever fuel. Fuel is super expensive right now, so I want to, I want to take the shortest route. And you can still get this done with, with a manual tool. It becomes already tricky, I would say, if you say, well, I don't want to drive at night, right? What is the best time to leave in order to most likely avoid the, the best, the typical traffic jams? Because on the, if you drive from Munich to Hamburg, there are traffic jams. So when should I leave during daytime or early morning or afternoon to avoid the typical traffic jam? A manual tool will, won't tell you, I mean, then, you would have to take another tool to take this information into your manual processes, right? You would need to ask Google or whatever, Bing, um, some maps tool. And this would work, but it, it, it will start to be not ideal because you use like different tools to handle different constraints in your process. And then what if, right? So what if? How, how would my route, how would my, 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 my plan, how would my schedule change if I share the ride and pick up a colleague in Stuttgart? Well, game over here, right? This, this, this would, uh, this, this is just this one bit which makes this overall schedule here really, really hard to impossible to maintain. And so now we live in 2022. Everyone is driving a Tesla. So I want to, uh, optimize my route so that I have easy access to free charging stations for my electronic car. And, well, you know, will not work if I do everything manually. And, of course, when I start, start to travel um, and there are traffic jams ahead, how to adapt the route if you do it manually. And this is this is not possible. And so, you see, this is a, this is a super trivial example, right? Driving back half from Munich to Hamburg, um, it requires a driver's license and a car. And and it, it is easy to get a driver's license. Um, and also, like, access to cars is not very limited. Um, you can buy them, you can rent them, you can lease them, you can, you can share them, whatever. Um, so the, the task is very trivial, um, but it becomes tough if you add constraints to it. And if you add constraints to it, it definitely changes the requirements on the tool and on the tools that you use. And this is the other thing that I wanted to kind of make clear here that, that this is also one of the difference between planning and scheduling. In scheduling, you have to take into account a lot of tools and a lot of constraints, and this can create confusion going forward. So the scheduling constraints are all parameters that you must handle, right? And the more constraints you have, the more complex the scheduling challenge. So there, there will be an, an inflection point in your scheduling challenge where pure manual scheduling and pure manual planning will not work. So there will be an inflection point where you say, okay, my scheduling challenge is so hard, I have to take into account that many complex that I must look for automated scheduling tools to help me taking all of these constraints into account in one go. And with this, let's come to the last differentiation between planning and scheduling. And this is the plan is rough cut, whereas the schedule makes this rough cut plan actionable. It, it takes this and builds the production order and machine sequence. And let's Let's think a little bit about making a rough cut plan actionable. Because we all know when we do a plan, we say, hey, we are here and we want to go to here and we want to go the straight route, right? This is the plan. Reality is like this, right? You start and then you, as you see, you need to make a course correction and then you go a little bit different direction. You find the direction again, you have to run a loop, you're on track again, 
you get disturbed. So, so you will end at your goal, but most likely not the straight way. So let's state the obvious. Scheduling is always dealing with the future. This is, by the way, also why we don't have a lot of reports uh, in our because reports always look back. And scheduling is looking from today into the future. So scheduling means dealing with the future. And it is very normal and it is really fair that, that no, I mean, nobody can predict the future, right? If anyone could predict the future, she or he would be very, very rich or very, very powerful. It is, it is the nature of the things that future always come with things that you cannot predict, right? And so it is really normal that your schedule will change. This picture here is absolutely unrealistic. And this picture is absolutely realistic and absolutely understandable. Because when you make the plan, you make an assumption of the future. And then you get the, real, the reality check and you need to make course corrections. But on average, you need to get there where you planned you wanted to go, but most likely it will not be the direct way. So let's state something that is not that obvious, but I think that is very important in this context is if you manage to avoid short term changes to your schedule, then you will have a more efficient execution. So you can plan. And it is okay that you cannot predict the future. And it is really okay that you change your schedule, right? This, is, this, is, this happens every day to every organization on this planet. They change their schedule day by day by day. But it makes a difference if you change the schedule that you had for today or if you change the schedule that you have for next week, right? This is a difference because if you change the schedule for today, that you, if you change the schedule that you made yesterday for today, then, then with a very high probability, this creates chaos and confusion on the shop floor. And it, it disturbs the execution. It has a direct effect on what is happening. But if you change the schedule for next week, then this can also cause some turbulences and can cause some issues and maybe your purchasing department will be angry because they have to uh, to accelerate the purchase of some goods that are hard to get for supply chain issues or whatever but but the impact of a change that you make to the schedule for next week is not that dramatic as if you make a, a change to the schedule for today or tomorrow so what i highly encourage you is that you try to get something that I would call in, in, in brackets managed life and you see the little difference here. So I I absolutely, I'm absolutely fine with changing, with constantly changing the schedule. But I also encourage you to find really hard for this area here where we said, okay, when we start executing the plan, we try to keep it as stable as possible. So if I schedule something today for tomorrow, I'm, I'm in the manufacturing industry, right? If I'm scheduling something today for tomorrow, then let's all agree that tomorrow we won't make any fancy changes. We try to keep just the tomorrow as stable as we can and accept that the day after tomorrow, there will be a lot of loops and a lot of changes. But there should be a short period of time that you keep stable because this alone will really, really increase your efficiency. And this comes to my for, for, uh, this 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 leads to my fourth and last recipe for how to win the battle between planning and scheduling. If you agree that constantly changing an action plan negatively impacts both effectiveness and efficiency, then decide and design for stability. So we all know, we all know this, this domino chain, right? Um, you, you hit, hit one of these domino bricks and then everything falls apart, right? And this is, this is what's happening here, right? You change one thing and then there's a lot of confusion and you need to change a lot of other things. When it comes to scheduling and when it comes to making planning and scheduling works, 
build breaking points into your domino chain. In other words, decide for a stability area in your schedule. Decide for an area in your schedule that you really, really, really keep stable. As good and as hard as you can. But you need to make this decision that there is this stability area. And this can be today or this can be today and tomorrow. This mustn't be an, in, an, an unrealistic period of time. But there must be a consensus within you as a manufacturing or within your manufacturing client that there is an area in their schedule that they keep stable. And if they don't do, there will be efficient inefficiencies, inefficiencies, and more inefficiencies. And then we will always have planning and scheduling like in a battle. So now let's take these four recipes and cook a bit. And, and I, I just have them summarized here on the slides. I will not run through them here again, but just see how we can actually turn these recipes into action. And this will take me another five minutes and then I will come to a demo and show you of how I could see all of this conceptually and practically working. Um, so first, first a recipe, different tasks require different tools. For planning, I really recommend use standard business central functionality, use production orders, use infinite capacity. There are super good tools in standard business center. You have the planning worksheet with uh, MPS, with the master production schedule, which I think is really a great thing if you're a make to stock or if you combine make to order, make to stock, where you have some predictable demands for your components, where you may have also some sales orders um, for, the, for the finished products, and then run the planning worksheet regularly to determine what is the demand, what is the supply, and create new production orders in the bucket of time sense that we discussed. Or if you are more or less a pure MTO, then constantly create the sales orders on uh, uh, the production orders from sales orders or blanket orders and say, okay, here again, there's a new concrete demand from one of these customers, or there's new um, concrete demand coming from this blanket order for these customers. They create new production orders and just let them hit the system. And then those production orders that are basically created by business central planning, and this could be the planning worksheet or this could be the creation of the product from the sales orders, but this is how business central does the planning. And this is then, as we had in the on one of the very first slides, the input data for scheduling. And unfortunately for you guys, luckily for me, business central standard does not have proper scheduling tools out of the box. So business central, all the standard functionality is really cool for planning, but there is nothing for scheduling. The good news is, is as always, if there are functional gaps within business central, there is an app for that, right? Get an app to close this gap, but don't try to use the business central planning tools for scheduling. It just will create frustration and it will just make things worse than it was before. And the apps that we have to offer is the VPS, the Visual Production Scheduler, which is manual scheduling. So if you have not that many constraints, will perfectly work. If you have more constraints, if you have more production, if you have more velocity, then we have another product that is called VAPS, Visual Advanced Production Scheduler. And this is to my knowledge, the only scheduling product that combines automatic and manual scheduling all in one tool. And, and there are other, there are other, other real great scheduling tools and scheduling apps out there. Of course, I recommend ours, but, but if you don't like ours, um, then I'm, I'm okay with this. Um, then, but then still make sure you use different tools for planning and scheduling. If you use ours, then actually we give you also capabilities to define timeframes for what, what I call the concrete scheduling and the buckets of time planning, right? This is, this is a screenshot from the VAPS and it's completely naked, um, naked in a way that there are no production orders, but it shows you actually, right? You see that there are some machine centers, some work centers, there's a timeline, and you see there are these vertical lines. 
So in the VAPS, we build functionality to support this differentiation between concrete timing and this bucket of time planning. So we have the red line. The red line is the work date. So this is today. And we have this purple line. This is what we call the end of the frozen period. And the VAPS is designed in a way that the period between today and the end of the frozen period, this is VAPS's responsibility. So this is the time frame where you do the concrete scheduling, the machine order, production order sequencing, where you really make it actionable. After the end of the frozen period, we have the MPS responsibility. Here the planning worksheet is responsible. This is where we allow the bucket in time planning. The VAPS also schedules those production orders in, in that area, taking into account constraints like finite capacity, but also we say we can fully accept if demand and supply situation changes and the MPS deletes production orders, creates new production. Okay, then we schedule them again. We really don't care that much what is happening here. It gives us good indication how we will use or, or how we will need capacity, but but what we really take care for is this area where the VAPS is, respons is responsible and where also we don't allow the MPS to make any changes. So if you sequence things here, MPS and the planning workshop will not destroy it, will not change it. This is where the concrete timing happens and where, where we don't allow the bucket, the, the bucket of time schedule uh, planning to shuffle things around. Then, if we are with the VAPS, we give you a lot of automated scheduling tools, and some of them I will show you in a couple of minutes. Like, we give you tools that tell you when I can finish a production at earliest, when I can finish at earliest, taking into account all allowed machines. We give you a tool to efficiently schedule all new production orders. We give you a tool to accelerate the rush order. We give you tools to reduce idle times without respecting the sequence operation and with respecting the sequence operation. And we are building automated scheduling tools basically or more or less every quarter. So this gets richer and richer and richer and richer with mostly every release that we do once a quarter. And then last but not least, have the stability area in your schedule. So let's go back to this picture that we just had. We said, okay, we have this area of responsibility for the VAPS where we really do the very concrete scheduling where we take the planning data and turn them into an actionable plan. And if you look very closely, then I introduced this red line as the today line and the purple line as the end of frozen period. We also have something that we call the scheduling start. And the scheduling start for us is the first date that we take for automatic scheduling, which means there is an area between today and the scheduling start. And by the way, you can define the gap between today and the scheduling start, and you can define the gap between today and the end of frozen period. So these are individual settings that you can make. But as there is always a dedicated gap between today and the scheduling start, there is actually an area in the VAPS where you do manual scheduling only. And this is what we call the stability area. There is no algorithm, nothing, no automatism, nothing that changes production orders that are in this period between the red line and the blue line. This is what we call the stability area. And we, 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 you can change things there manually, but we say just do it to handle exceptions. But keep it stable to make sure that operations are efficient and only change from a from this very short term plan if there is an exception and then the rest of this this is where automatic scheduling there you get all the efficiencies of automatic scheduling starting from the scheduling start and um, taking into account a lot of constraints and taking into account an increasing number of constraints this is automatic scheduling this is efficiency and then we have like the, the the bucket of time planning afterwards. And to my knowledge, this combination of having a manual area plus 
an automatic scheduling within one tool and within one UI, within one surface. This is pretty unique um, in the business central ecosystem. And I would like to take a couple of minutes to actually have a look how I can see those puzzle pieces and um, working together. And I can also see how these recipes get applied. So let me quickly log into Business Central again. And I have the VAPS um, installed here. So I will work with the VAPS because I also have like an example here where I have a lot of constraints. So I need to do some automatic scheduling. So first of all, when you do the VAPS, you run a simulation and the simulation is a copy of your production data on which you do the scheduling so that you can also have multiple simulations. You can compare them and then you can um, can can publish the simulation that you like best. So now I created simulation. So I copied all my production orders for a given time frame um, into a separate table. And now I can view the simulation um, in, a, in a nice graphical way. So I have a, uh, let's say, a resource Gantt chart where I have my work center groups, my work centers, and my machine centers here on the left-hand side. I have a time scale. I have my work date line. So in my example, it's the 28th of January 21. This is the red line. I have a scheduling start. I set it for today plus three days. And I have the end of frozen period. And I set it for today plus, I think, three weeks. So I have this manual area here which is now basically today and tomorrow, so Thursday and Friday. And then I have the three weeks of time where I say this is where automatic scheduling is. And afterwards, um, you see that I have some production orders there, and I will add a couple of more in a minute. But but this is where I don't care if, if uh, the planning worksheet kind of shuffles it all around. I really want to make sure I have a really good schedule, an actionable schedule for the next, let's say, three weeks. And you see, there is something that is called the standby resource. So the standby resource is where we differentiate those production orders that are new to Business Center, that have been added to Business Center, and that I am, as a scheduler, need to schedule. And now you see, actually, OK, here is this production order. It is in dark blue, so that means it's firm planned. The orange ones are released. And now I am, as the production scheduler, have to get it to the schedule in the most efficient way and i could drag and drop this but but i don't want to do this i want to just say okay uh, vaps please show me um the earliest available resources to get this done so i can say on the right mouse click apply alternative routing then i have defined machine centers that i can use for every routing step vaps looks at this and then schedules it accordingly and because I selected a single production order and it saw some free space in the manual area, it added it to the manual area. And then you see it found a gap here on drilling. It, it put it to assembly, put it to quality control. So I'm done here. I think we need to be done uh, done here. So that that looks quite good. So now I scheduled this and, and there is nothing more to schedule. I have no exceptions, no issues right now. So I can, ah, right now, let me go back again. Actually, um, I go back to the production that I just scheduled um, because, you know, I scheduled in, in a very near term frame. So I scheduled it starting tomorrow. So I want to make sure that the guys can start to work on it. So actually, um, I, I, I want to release it here from the from the VAPS, right? So I say change production status. I want to release it, um, and boom, it's released. And now you see it's released in the schedule, right? Um, so now I'm happy with this. I published the simulation so that I have my uh, my this this new updated data when I run the next simulation. And so now. This is what I do as the scheduler. Then we have the planning person. The planning person works the planning worksheet. And the planning, uh, running the planning worksheet is checking if there is some new demand, right? So I actually prepare the generative plan. I take into account the forecast for this year. I take into account the next couple of months. 
I'm just looking at certain items that I'm going to produce and I run the planning worksheet and you see there is actually some new demand, right? I see a bunch of new production orders um, that the planning suggests me to do taking into account infinite capacity as Business Central does it. And the planner says, okay, this all makes sense. If there is the demand, I need to carry out the action messages. So I create firm plan production orders, okay? Um, so I create all those new production orders. And now those new production orders are created. And at some point of time, the production scheduler says, hey, actually, let me see if I have new production orders to schedule. So I create a new simulation, including firm plan production orders for the week, looking a week back and two months out. Um, I create a new simulation and I see actually, you see last time I had 31 production orders, now I have 41. So the new production orders are now part of my simulation. And you see actually, all this demand that comes from those new production orders now sits on the standby resource, right? So you see, I have a lot of production orders here on the standby resource. They all come from, uh, they, they, they all come uh, because I ran MRP, bucket of time planning, MRP positioned it there, take, not taking into account any capacity. And by the way, if you think these standby resources, when those things stack up are too high, you just can show also the operation overlapped in one row so that you just see that there is some stuff waiting there to be scheduled. The thing is, if you if you overlap this, it is hard to select one production order um, because you not no longer can uh, differentiate them. But um, you also must not necessarily do this because with the VAPS, you can do automatic scheduling. So I now can also say schedule and add all those new production orders to the schedule so that I get an efficient and realistic new schedule for all those production orders that were just added. And I also see that some actually may run late because the current capacity utilization. So I could try to figure out what I can do. But first of all, let's 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 reflect that we that we created new demand by the planning worksheet turned the demand into production order and then saw the production order here saw that i i'm as the scheduler have to take some action which i did and now i see actually a new situation i i saw them and i scheduled them efficiently automatically taking into account finite capacity and a bit more restrictions that I have. So now um, we said we have this manual area today and tomorrow in my case here that we want to keep as stable as possible. Okay, keeping things as stable as possible is, is a fair idea, but we all know that exceptions can happen. And one exception can be, okay, this, I, I got the information that tomorrow I actually can't run my welding workplace number four or my welding machine center number four from eight in the morning until whatever, 8 p.m., right? So so I got the information, okay, we, something is wrong here. We need to do a machine maintenance or uh, we need to do some repair or whatever. So I, I, have, I have an issue here tomorrow and this falls now into the area that I wanted to keep stable as good as I can. So what I can do as a scheduler, I can actually define downtime, right? I can define downtime on the 29th of January. Um, and I want to start at eight. Um, I want to finish the same day at uh, at 8 p.m. And I want to see whatever. Um, machine maintenance, right? So when I do this, you now see I got this red block here in the, in, the, in the background. If I hover over it on the description, I see, hey, there's a machine maintenance and the production order, the operation that was scheduled to that machine center now is on the standby resource again because it was scheduled here and I can't run it here. So now 
it's my job as the scheduler to make sure um, to, to deal with this. And so one, one option could be I can put it now, drag and drop it to welding station number two, but then this has an impact on the successor, so it pushes out uh, the subsequent operation, but it didn't cause any production order to turn late because I don't see any red bubble, red dot. So this is something that I could do now or can do manually in order to deal with this situation, right? So now, now I'm I'm good with this. I I scheduled all those uh, all those production orders. I'm pretty fine. I'm I'm good with it. So I leave the schedule. I publish it again, and I have a new schedule. I don't need this simulation. It's pretty old. Um, it's from uh, earlier this morning. So now I, I did my job, and then what happens next is my friends in the sales department. They get they get a new order, right? They get a new order from the Silingurian Limited. The Silingurian Limited, although they have an overdue balance, they are my number one customer, right? They are super important, and they request uh, something for they they request something ASAP. So next week, right? Today is the twenty eighth of January. They they let's see, and uh, today is the twenty eighth of January. Um, and they respect, uh, they expect something by the end of next week, right? Very urgent. Um, and they expect whatever item 5002, whatever item 5002 is, and they expect me to ship 25 units. Um, and I immediately turn this production order into a firm plant production order. And now um, if I'm as the production planner, create a simulation again, then we see there's a new production order and this is on standby. And now I have to make sure that I get this thing on time into the schedule. And the guys told me already, okay, you need to deliver it definitively by the 5th of February. So let's make, let's, let's figure out how this can happen. And then I can say, okay, I actually have some free time here today on my drilling machine. So let me, let me check what happens if I say play routing. Um, okay. Then uh, originally it would go to drilling one. So that's not a good idea. Let's check if drilling two is allowed. Um, so I say apply alternative routing. It schedules it to here. It finds a slot on the saw. I can push it to welding. I can go to assembly and I can tell my sales guys, okay, um, I could squeeze this in today. I could squeeze this in into my stable area because I had some free capacity here. Um, I'm good. So um, you can confirm the customer that we can deliver by the 5th of February. So you saw there are a lot of tools that we have here to schedule. The good message is, or the message is, the scheduling tool integrates with business central planning capabilities. Planning capabilities can be creating the production from the sales order or planning capabilities are the planning worksheet um, with the MPS. So the VAPS is integrated with both and the VAPS gives you the power of automatic scheduling, but also the ease of manual scheduling. It is both combined and it, it's put into a concept where you have the VAPS area, where you have the bucket of time area and within the VAPS area, you have the manual area and you have an automatic area. And with this, I would say, you are really prepared to win the battle between planning and scheduling. And with this, um, I'm at the end of what I had prepared for today. It's basically in time, um, which surprised me. I, I, uh, when, I uh, when I made the slides, I thought uh, I would significantly overrun. Um, so 
this worked out quite well. And if you have a question, then I'm happy to ask them now. And I see there is one question. Will VPS um, check materials too when doing the automatic planning? So the VAPS that we look, and this is a great question, the VAPS that we looked at right now actually has a functionality that I didn't discuss right now. This functionality called is EMAT earliest material availability date. So the VAPS that we looked at right now takes the material availability into account as another constraint for scheduling. With the VPS, the pure manual product that we have, um, we don't have material availability information, but with the VAPS, the Visual Advanced Production Scheduler that I showed you a couple of minutes ago, yes, we take into account material when doing the automatic planning. Do you have any other question? If not, are there another question? Cool. What about components availability, changing arrival dates from suppliers? So if you set up your business central in a way that the changing arrival dates are updated in the purchase orders, then we take this into account when doing the EMAT, the earliest material availability uh, date calculation. So the EMAT is a date that, that we calculate within the VAPS and we do a, a virtual allocation of uh, a component supply to component demand. And we take information from the purchase orders to determine the availability of the component. So if your supplier tells you that they won't deliver tomorrow, but next week, Friday, and if you update your expected receipt date um, in the purchase order, then this will get taken into account. Does the next question is, does the VAPS confirm, uh, convert the firm plant to a release production order after you confirm the simulation? No, this is nothing that we do automatically. So you have to release the production order either like I did on right mouse click or you have to release them from Business Central, or actually the VAPS has an um, API um, that, that, that allows you or your partners to extend and to personalize your Business Central. So you could uh, build an extension that builds on the VAPS. And with, extension, with this extension, you basically could say, okay, if there is a production order, that got is there, if there is a firm plan production order that got scheduled within the with the VAPS and the simulation got published and this firm plan re, uh, production order whatever starts within the next ten days then automatically release this. So we don't have this as a function out of the box, but you can build this with the API of the VAPS. So these are really cool questions, actually. Thank you very much. Um, if you have more questions, then ask them now or send me an email, connect with me on LinkedIn. Um, I'm really happy to get you in contact. I'm happy that you were here today and listened to my a bit theoretical slides in the beginning, but I, I hoped it makes or I hope it makes sense uh, when you saw the demo. And with this, thank you very much for today and see you in one of our next webinars. Uh, stay safe and healthy and talk to you soon. Bye for now. Bye bye.